Welcome to the New Order. There are so many fascinating countries to play in this particular modification, but I wanted to jump in and attempt a Let's Play as Andrei Vlasov of Samara. This is a pretty, pretty hazy and brutal group. Uh, born of hazy post-war plans, the Russian Liberation Army, or ROA, was envisioned as nothing more than a collaborator militia writ large. Led by General Vlasov and a collection of turncoat Red Army officers, the ROA was meant to help legitimize German control of Arke Moscovian until the Russians could be driven further east or exterminated. The West Russian War in the 50s changed all of this. Expanded by the desperate Germans and deployed to delay the resurgent Red Army, the ROA thrived against all odds and soon found itself pushing east. By the war's end, Vlasov and his men controlled a power base beyond the Reich's grasp. Written off as mutinous rabble, the ROA has spent the intervening years waiting. Some hope for redemption, and others merely wait for the opportunity to carve an empire in Western Russia and beyond. So, as you can see, we are in a country that is, without a shadow of a doubt, a despotic uh, hellhole. And what we'd like to do is try and conquer all of these other Russian provinces. Essentially, Russia in this mod is a collection of different warlords. Most of them fascist or communist. Some of them are, you know, they do have a small democracy like the one in uh, Siberia, but it's, it's really a democracy in name only. And as for our guy, Vlasov, he's a strongman. He's also, of course, um, unfortunately kind of considered a puppet of sorts. And we're going to do our best to try and change that and make Vlasov a truly glorious general. As another year rolls on, our guide Andrei Vlasov continues his Sisyphean reconquest effort. Whatever power he gathers, his underlings steal. Whatever legitimacy he possesses, the German bombings strip away. The sad man grows older, buried under the weight of history and the judgment of those outside his borders. Yet he has not yet given up for the upcoming troubles in Germany may signal his one last chance. For now, his greatest quality is that he is able to maintain a coalition. Various generals like him better than they like one another, and the people have found the rule fair, if not particularly noteworthy. There are worse places in Russia than Samara, certainly, but if Vlasov is to serve as a new guide to a renewed Russia, he must begin anew his consolidation of military and popular support. So we are going to start... Um, getting the guide focus. We've got research slots available, and typically, I first of all check to see if we've got night vision. We definitely don't. But we've also got to focus on our industry and being able to get resources, natural resources. The problem is that's going to take 424 days, so I'm going to actually focus on the improved computing machine and try to lower our overall research time. Another focus that well, a decision that we're going to need to make regularly here is the decision of raiding for loot. You see, since we live in this absolute nightmare that is Russia in this particular world, um, we need to actually scavenge for a lot of loot that otherwise we could probably just produce in our factories. We also want to develop our warlord. We want to make sure that people, of course, take Vlasov fairly seriously. And uh, the way we can do that is through warlord development. But of course, first we have to unlock some points um, and proceed. So we're going to do just that. We do have some unassigned divisions. And I think now is as good a time as any to show you guys that we do have a pretty nice air force, number one. Um, but to explain to you guys what's going on um, here in our country. So I'm just going to give you a basic description. And if you want me to do um, videos, you know, talking about each individual nation, please let me know. I'd love to do that. But basically, Samara is an ally, kind of an ally of the Germans here. Um, but at the same time, they don't view us as worthy enough to add into their faction. And they also don't view us as really racially acceptable. So they do this thing called terror bombings. And what they do is they fly their planes over all of Russia and just basically carpet bomb any location they can find, including Samara. So we're going to probably undergo some issues from these terror bombings too. And there is a way that perhaps we could stand up to them and put a stop to it. But again, my goal in this particular Let's Play is, number one, to try to unify Russia, and also survival. Survival is the most important thing here. We're certainly not playing as the good guys, not even close to it. Um, so we need to do our best with what we've got. We've also got some political, military, economic, and social laws 
and you can actually take a look over here just really quickly um, at what they are. We could change these, and who knows? Maybe over time, we can make sure that Samara becomes a world power. Now, this is fascinating. On the 19th of January, 1962, Eberhard Kordner became the first man to ever land on the moon. That's right. In this universe, my friends, the Germans, though actually the Nazi party, is the first to land on the moon here. Um, and the space race has been won by them. Japan is second in terms of research, and I believe the United States is third. Really, the United States is the only beacon um, of democracy apart from Scotland and I believe also Sweden. Uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Ireland is also a democracy, uh, authoritarian democracy, but yeah. So these are one of the few democracies in the world, uh, but we're not going that route. We are unabashedly dictatorial-minded, authoritarian-minded. I don't know if we are actual national socialists or fascists quite. We're really just despots under Andrei Vlasov. So we can almost call ourselves Vlasovians. All right, here we go, guys. So we can go down the Our Voice focus, uh, the Their Puppet focus, which would essentially put us kind of under German control, but we're going to need to do this anyway. Our consolidation effort goes through Mlieti Zhikov. Zhikov is difficult to describe, for much of his past is cloaked in mystery. Few claim to know where he comes from. The man himself claims to have been a leading ideologue in the opposition to the Soviet government, and he has indeed shown himself to be a highly talented public speaker and propagandist. His effort to reach the people of Russia in general, and Samara in particular, have done much to generate what few shreds of good reputation we possess. Zhikov is among the greatest advocates of freedom and democracy in our, in our officer corps, specified there very specifically, and he has built himself a small clique around this position. His aim is not merely to free Russia from both warlordism and from the Germans, but to bring forth a new, carefully supervised democracy. To many militarists in our government, he is a soft man. To German loyalists, he is a decadent parasite intent on betraying our German benefactors. And one fascinating thing about well, amongst many others, about this modification is I can already see where this is going. We've got three different factions. We've got the militarist faction, we've got the reformer faction, which is this guy, and we've got the puppet faction, which essentially would put us on par, well, with uh, allies to Germany uh, and just a puppet state underneath their yoke. Now, I'm hoping that Samara has a lot more going for her than just a puppet state. Vlasov's aides walked constantly to and fro to the old man's office, the title nature of their movement echoing the old man's current situation. Even in these desperate times, few could stomach working directly for the traitor general himself. Those that managed to either ignore or muster indifference towards their accusations against Vlasov found themselves buried in drudgery, bored out of their wits instead of merely disgusted by their stench of treason. Better, perhaps, to pray for an assignment on the border, instead, where death and starvation dispelled the lethargy. Wow, so it's very, very boring um, under Vlasov. Vlasov stood on political quicksand, his position shifting and changing by the day, but never improving. Some of his aides suspected that the old man would have preferred being genuinely hated by his generals instead of their current indifference. In the college of traitors that filled the ROA's upper echelon, Vlasov's, Vlasov was not particularly liked, but nor was he disliked. Whatever coalition or common ground he tried to build usually disintegrated from within a month. Wow. So, of course, Vlasov, you know, he's in a difficult position. I mean, we don't really know the inner workings of this man, and, and more than likely, he's a pretty evil guy. He certainly is a traitor. But, you know, something tells me that there's, there's hope here. Um, for those of you that don't know, he is an ex-Red Army general. This guy actually did uh, fight for the Soviets at one point, but that ended, and he turned to be completely in favor of the Reich. Um, of course, trying to be their puppet, and that didn't work out for him. Sitting beside... Now, I'm not going to read these stories, guys, but if you enjoy my narration and you want me to continue reading in the future, let me know in the comments, and I will absolutely read these. But these are sort of just kind of additional stories about life in Samara. Um, the same with the modern Bogatyr. This is actually more just life in Russia in general. All right, we're missing equipment production. Let's see exactly what we're missing and if we have sufficient military factories. So support equipment. All right, um, let's go ahead and get support equipment. We, we have a shortage, especially in rifles, well, actually in machine guns. So the next military factory we get, I'm going to drop right there. 
Armaments Factory No. 14 was a small complex near the Samara rail yards. Repurposed by the ROA itself during the darkest days of the terror bombing, the small shack was soon built up. The factory, in reality, was little more than a large building with a few long wooden tables and a number of machine tools, which was dedicated to taking apart German small arms and reverse engineering them for our own purposes. Vlasov and most of them under him knew well that their German support would eventually run out, and they had long made provisions to ensure that their myriad of German equipment, from Car 98s to STG-44s, would remain operable even once it was no longer possible to receive their parts from their former benefactors, neither officially nor through smugglers. The factory rarely worked during the day, the bombings made it hard to, but workers toiled all night with small headlamps and minimal light, disassembling old or well-worn rifles with their respective ammunitions. These workers, despite their rugged condition, were not civilians. Not officially, at least. They were engineers, not just employees of the ROA, but members of it, and experienced in handling German weapons for many years. Until recently, the factory had been minimally staffed. However, with the increasing amount of bloody victories won by the ROA, the soldiers of the front line needed more and more weapons. And the number of, what th of those that we can get from the German smugglers is becoming minuscule compared to our needs. As such, armaments, armaments Factory Number 14 has, as of recently, expanded not only in terms of manpower, but location as well. A number of shoddily constructed buildings have been added to the original complex. All right. So guys, we aren't going to be making original rifles, but we are going to be constructing sort of remakes of German rifles, uh, essentially what the Chinese have done with a lot of Soviet weaponry. Now, an assassin has attempted to kill Hitler, and for those of you not looking at the timeline, this is 1962. Hitler is still alive, but more than likely, he's not going to be alive for much longer. And a civil war in Germany might give us a chance to expand our territory. Because right now, if we were to try to expand, if the Germans didn't like where we were expanding to, they could easily just attack us. Well, as a matter of fact, we're kind of like a bug to them right now. Reichskommissariat Moscovian, which is owned by Kosh, um, and this is a career officer, a well-known German officer um, that is experienced in killing partisans. He could crush us like a bug. So we obviously want to be careful. Now, there are a few events, just looking at the political points. Now, we still have to unlock a few political points, but no, um, I'm trying to see if we can start looking for... We can prepare a raid. There we go. We can start scavenging for loot. Um, so, essentially, we're scavenging amongst the destroyed buildings because of the terror bombings and trying to look for pieces that we could potentially use um, in the future here. We've already actually um, started producing some infantry. I didn't mention it to anybody, but if you look over here, we've got our Ruskaya Pehotnaya and the, Reserv the Reservnaya Pehotna, uh, the troops and just standard infantry, and we're about to drop them. Now, unfortunately, as you can see here, in terms of manpower, we don't have a lot of free manpower. We're likely going to have to unlock more with our decisions here, and uh, that's something we will focus on as we proceed forward. Following the recent attempt on the German Fuhrer's life by a suspected Kenpei Tai agent, the pressure upon the Fuhrer to name an official successor and the Reichstag to formally recognize the choice has been steadily building. After almost a week of debate and speculation, Adolf Hitler today appeared on live television from the Reichstag and announced to the Reich that his successor would be Martin Bormann. Oh my goodness. Considered the most likely choice, the decision has been welcomed by the moderate and conservative elements of Germany, although the liberals and some elements of the military have expressed concern, with Bormann's commitment to staying on the course of Nazism with only minor reform. Albert Speer, Hermann Göring, and Reinhard Heydrich have criticized the choice as being certain to drive the Reich into an early grave. Well, that's again good for us, because despite pretty much being the Reich's lapdog, if they have a big problem, well then we have a little more power in this region, a little more room to maneuver, if you were. And being the den of vipers that we are, we definitely need some room to slither around here. Now, I want to just take a quick look here at the unassigned divisions. We might as well go ahead and create the first army of the state of Samara. So let's do it, guys. We will assign a commander. We've got Mikhail Miandrov. We've got Fyodor Turukin. A lot of different um, soldiers here. Now, I think, you know, um, defense is going to be the most important thing to us. But at the same time, we are going to have to expand if we want to survive. So I'm going to take Miandrov. And this guy is quite good in attack. He's politically connected, which gives him a promotion cost uh, boost. He's cautious. He's a winter specialist. And uh, I believe we can also assign a new trait here. 
Let me just take a look. I think these are specifically for field marshals. So winter specialist, winter expert. It's going to cost 15, um, and I, I don't know exactly what to call that, uh, command power points to be able to unlock more. So I will select him for now. In fact, we might have to promote him. Unable to promote. Wait a minute. All right, we're going to have to take a not-so-skilled commander here. Um, he's still fine, Fyodor Truken, 3-3-2-2. Three, three, two, two. But over time, we will get that brand-new commander. Well, I think at least for now, this army will keep our villainous rump state um, fairly safe. But if you guys enjoyed this particular episode, make sure to let me know by hitting that like button, maybe dropping a comment down below about what you think of the current world situation, and we'll absolutely do some more episodes here. Thank you so much, folks. I'll see you in the next one.